Senator Bob Wykowski, the chair of CSG West Energy and Environment Committee. Thank you all for joining us today. Today's webinar on climate, climate adaptation and what states are doing to address it is, fair, is very timely. We've seen some powerful examples of extreme weather recently with several hurricanes, floods, and fires hitting several countries and states in just the past few weeks. This is also a subject that I'm very passionate about, and, and I believe despite the work that is ongoing today regarding adaptation, we must do much, much more to build resiliency throughout our country and here in the West. We have two great presenters that I will turn uh, the webinar over to in just a minute. However, two years ago, as chair of California's Senate Environmental Quality Committee, I held several hearings across our state with the goal of strengthening our adaptation policy. What we heard from local, private, nonprofit, and government leaders working on adaptation efforts was a desire for more collaboration, sharing the best practices and the latest and best scientific information. The result of those hearings was the creation of the Integrated Climate Adaptation and Resiliency Program, or what we call in California, the ICARP. It includes a technical advisory council and acts as a clearinghouse for climate adaptation information. Local workers with responsibility over adaptation issues want a good, trusted source to turn to when issues come up in their community. Having the council in place enables them to act more quickly on scientific information and better understand some of the challenges involved with building resiliency. I'm a big proponent of adaptation efforts. Obviously, the effects of climate change are here today. Severe weather systems, several years of drought, flooding, longer uh, wildfire seasons, and increased cases of vector-borne diseases, meeting all these, these challenges are going to become an increasingly important task of governments. If your state is like mine, uh, then the thought and level of adaptation investment in cities and counties is a little hit and miss. Some areas uh, have given this more thought than others. Our work will, will become even more important for those communities that are slow to react. Regardless of what's happening at the federal level, I know we all want our states to move forward and boost uh, climate adaptation in the West. So as I said we earlier, we have two terrific presenters. First, we have Jonathan Parf Parfrey, uh, who's the executive director of Climate Resolve, a nonprofit dedicated to creating real practical solutions to meeting the climate challenge. We also have Ashley Lawson, is a senior solution fellow from the Center of Climate and Energy Solutions, where she evaluates climate policies and provides expert advice to policymakers and works on climate resilience efforts by businesses, cities, and states. So on with the show, let me turn it uh, over to uh, Rich Lindsay and our two presenters. Rich? Thank you, Senator. I'm Rich Lindsay, and I am a policy consultant for the Council of State Governments West, and among my responsibilities is to staff the uh, Energy and Environment Committee for the Senator. And uh, with that, Ashley, I believe you're up. <laughs> Hi. Well, thank you, Rich. Uh, thanks to everyone for having me here today. I sit in Washington, D.C., and tend to think about issues across the country. And it's always so interesting to focus on issues that are facing the West. You're in a really unique position in all of your states. On the one hand, you have tremendous climate challenges and the future climate that we're all going to live on, uh, live in is going to be very different than what we have today. Uh, across the states that are represented in CSG West, it's literally every climate change impact under the sun. Uh, okay, maybe not hurricanes, but basically every challenge that is facing the earth, you're going to be wrestling with and finding solutions with and really leading the way. And uh, you have a lot of help. There's a tremendous amount of research, scientific uh, institutions, research universities across the West are the very best in the world. So there's a tremendous access for quality data and insights that can be a tool for you as you're planning for the future climate uh, that you're going to live in. So thank you again for the invitation and the chance to talk with you today. I'm going to be sharing just a few high-level perspectives about adaptation options and really what it means to be talking about climate adaptation at all. But first I'll introduce my organization for those of you who may not be familiar with us. The Center for Climate and Energy Solutions, or C2ES as we call ourselves, 
uh, has been around for a long time. We're an independent, nonpartisan, nonprofit organization founded way back in 1998 to work on policy and action to reduce greenhouse gas emissions, to promote clean energy, and to strengthen resilience to climate impacts. We work with city and state and national policymakers, along with uh, the business community and other key stakeholders. And if we can look at the next slide, um, you'll see the logos of various companies that we work very closely with through our Business Environmental Leadership Council, or BELC, because we have a real knack for naming things around here. The companies in the BELC have something like $2 trillion in annual revenue and 3.5 million worldwide employees among them. They are all very large companies, and they all get that climate change is a challenge that is here and now and needs to be dealt with. So we use them as a source of information for us, um, but we do produce research that's independent of what any of these individual companies uh, might want or, or might individually support. So first today, before we get into talking about preparing for the climate of the future, I just wanted to share some observations about the climate of today and how it has changed from the climate of our parents and our grandparents' uh, generation. So the next couple of slides are going to show us actual observations. So these are not climate projections looking into the future. We're going to look at trends that we can measure right now. Every credible scientific analysis out there shows that these observed trends are going to grow over time, but the extent to which they do grow is still subject to some uncertainty. It depends on how much we continue to, uh, re to emit greenhouse gases, it depends on how sensitive the climate is, uh, and it depends upon some nuances that, that we still uh, have trouble anticipating. So we're going to look at observed trends to keep it a little simple, and just keep in mind as you're thinking about the future that there's just going to be more of what we see already. And by the way, I'll just take a short second to plug uh, a webinar that C2AS is actually putting on tomorrow. If you're curious about some of the more technical details that go into the climate projections uh, and how those can be used um, by public sector and also by private sector, uh, we'll have a webinar featuring San Diego Gas and Electric, uh, a company who's going to be talking with us about how they're making investment decisions using climate data, and some federal scientists talking about those data resources. So you can go to our website, c2es.org, that's the letter C, the number two, letter E, letter S, uh, to find information about that event. Uh, now, on to the facts. So the pictures here are showing you uh, that the West is drier and hotter than it used to be. The picture on the left shows the change in snowpack seen in April measured at different monitoring stations uh, across the Western lower 48. So any site that's marked by an orange bubble there is a site that has seen a decrease in snowpack over the last 60 years. And any site with a blue bubble there has actually seen an increase in snowpack. So you can see there's some natural variability here. But on average, uh, among these stations, there's been a 23% drop in level of snowpack, which is mostly caused by warming temperatures over the winter, meaning that more precipitation is falling as rain and snow, and so it's not being, snored, uh, not being stored. Excuse me. So this is a concerning trend, of course, because decreasing snowpack raises concerns about water supply, water storage, and major implications for agriculture, industry, and consumers, too. The picture on the right is showing us observed rate of temperature change across the United States. The dark red regions are those that are warming the fastest. Uh, blue regions are about the same or even cooling slightly. But you can see that most of those red regions are located in the west. Uh, I should mention that Hawaii isn't shown here, but has also seen a warming trend of about a de degree and a half. Uh, that would be on the light pink uh, color on this figure. So hotter temperatures are a concern by themselves, because if you have a hotter average temperature, it means that the extreme temperatures you see are going up even faster. So those extreme heat events can be very dangerous for outdoor workers, for low-income households, uh, the people who can't afford air conditioning. Um, now, the upside is that winters are also becoming milder and there's a longer growing season, so you do have some positive impacts because of the temperature, but in the quantification studies that have been done, it's those negative impacts that really outweigh the positive. 
if we think about what this might mean moving forward, increasing temperatures have lots of cascading effects besides just heat. You can have an increased risk of drought, longer fire seasons, the spread of pests uh, like the mount mountain pine beetle, uh, disease vectors, poorer air quality, uh, lots of concerns for, again, outdoor industries, agriculture, construction, uh, and also risks uh, from uh, risks for infrastructure and public health, uh, wildfire, for example. So those are really just a set of climate change impacts that's making the bad weather more of what you're used to, more and worse than what you're used to. If we go to the next slide and think about how climate change is changing coastal and marine ecosystems, this becomes a different class of impacts, really. This is a brand new world, which requires a new way of thinking about things. Uh, and even for inland districts uh, that I'm sure many of you represent, there are statewide and region-wide economic impacts that can come from damages along these coastal areas because of uh, the employment opportunities and the tax revenue that comes from coastal tourism, from fishing industry, uh, and of course lots of coastal infrastructure that's funded by state programs. All of these are going to become at risk. Uh, so even if you're not located on the coast, it's worth thinking about and understanding the risks that there are. So the big map is showing the observed changes in sea level uh, from different monitoring stations across the U.S. This is all data from NOAA. Green and yellow dots are stations where seas are actually rising. Uh, blue and purple dots are seeing sea levels fall. So for the U.S., most of the fall is happening in Alaska. That's a phenomenon known as isostatic rebound from the last glacial maximum. Uh, but for other country or other areas of the country, you're going to see mostly a sea level rise trend of about a foot a century. That's what's been observed to date. And the projections are, of course, that that trend would continue or possibly increase. For perspective, that's about the global average. Uh, other parts of the U.S. have it worse. Uh, but in these coastal areas, you're literally losing parts of your state to the sea and, uh, and anything that happens to be built along the sea as well. The other phenomenon is ocean acidification, and the chart on the right shows you some of the observed data here. This all comes from a monitoring station off the coast of Hawaii. The red line is CO2 measured in the air. This is the famous Keeling curve that first alerted us all to increasing atmospheric CO2 levels, uh, with data going back to the 50s. The green and the blue are both measuring the ocean, so not the atmosphere, but the ocean. The green is showing that the CO2 from the atmosphere actually dissolves into the ocean, and so that CO2 has been increasing in concentration in the ocean as well as the atmosphere. And then when that CO2 mixes with seawater, it makes an acid that causes the pH of the oceans to go down. And that's what the blue line is showing you here, that these things are happening um, in line with one another, which is exactly what we expect from just the basic physics and chemistry of climate change. Ocean acidification is a problem because the microorganisms that make up the base of the food chain in the ocean are very sensitive to ocean pH levels. So when pH goes down, these critters can literally dissolve away, and that can be very damaging not just to ecosystems, uh, but to marine fisheries and other sources of uh, other aspects of the economy that rely upon them. I'm getting all excited about climate impacts and maybe taking too much time. If you Go to the next slide. I may gloss over this. This is a study that came out not too long ago. I actually got a lot of press attention, so you may be familiar with it. This is an attempt at quantifying what the economic impacts are of these climate change impacts. Um, you can read the headline there that the hot arid counties are um, expected to see a fairly large economic loss or a shrinkage of the economy with a few caveats that are, I think, worth a second look, particularly for many of your districts. This study doesn't consider water supply or drought, doesn't consider disease vectors, doesn't consider population migration. Some of these things that people anticipate are going to have fairly large impacts in the West. Um, so I would caution that before you look at a slide like this and say, oh, many parts of the West are green, this is going to be good for us, um, that, that green is showing economic growth because of a longer growing season, um, it may be worth a closer look to, to think about all of the impacts. If we go to the next slide then, 
we'll finally get to the topic of the day. And that is, what is adaptation anyway? How do we understand and respond to climate risks? Uh, if I can go through this slowly, so maybe we can back up the animation, thanks. Um, the first top line here is just laying out the concepts for you. Uh, so what does it mean to be vulnerable to climate change? What are the factors that contribute to climate vulnerability? There are three of them shown here. Uh, two of them, the exposure and sensitivity, uh, as these go up, your vulnerability goes up. But the last one, adaptive capacity, as your adaptive capacity goes up, your vulnerability actually goes down. Uh, so that's a good thing. Um, the exposure to climate variation is really just a function of geography. So for example, coastal communities will have high exposure to sea level rise, while communities in semi-arid areas may be more exposed to drought. Sensitivity is the degree to which you're affected by that exposure. So if your local economy is dependent upon agriculture, uh, you may be much more sensitive to changing rainfall patterns than if your local economy is dominated by mining. And the adaptive capacity is the ability of a system to adjust to climate changes, uh, to reduce the potential damages, maybe to take advantage of opportunities that are there, basically just to cope with the consequences. Uh, so if we click through the animation, and think about maybe an example. Let's think about the climate threat of increased wildfires. So your vulnerability to wildfires can increase if your exposure goes up, if your sensitivity goes up, or if your adaptive capacity goes down. And you can read the bullet lists there of some examples of things that would increase your vulnerability. If you click through to the next animation, uh, this is a little bit the converse, the traits that would decrease your vulnerability. Um, decreasing your vulnerability is ways of decreasing exposure, decreasing sensitivity, and increasing adaptive capacity. And so what I'd like to spend the rest of my time talking about is what are the policies that can affect each of these factors, right? You have three levers to pull to try to reduce the vulnerability of your constituents to climate change. So we'll look at specific examples of each of these. If we click on the next, I just wanted to add a word about mitigation. Um, so action that we take to reduce greenhouse gases is related to this entire adaptation conversation in the sense that anything that reduces the magnitude of climate risks in the future is going to reduce exposure. And so that's one way of reducing vulnerability. Um, now, they are two very different things with two different scales of impact, um, but that's sort of the connection between actions you might consider to reduce greenhouse gases and actions that you would take to increase adaptation. All right, so keeping those three factors in mind, the first I said was exposure. If you have more exposure to climate threats, then you have more vulnerability. So how do we reduce that? Here's an example looking at wildfire um, and ways to reduce your exposure to wildfire. Looks like the formatting changed and we lost a word here, uh, but this is just an image showing defensible space. Uh, so you might imagine a policy that uh, sets a larger defensible space around homes so that if and when a fire happens, the home itself is exposed less. Uh, you might also think about population relocation, which is a conversation um, happening in Alaska. Communities are relocating right now because of coastal impacts and uh, warming that's happening. Relocation is a fairly drastic policy, um, but it's actually much less costly and disruptive to do it in a planned way to anticipate it, uh, impacts rather than to do a forced relocation like might happen in response to an event. Uh, and a lot of hurricanes tend to lead to the population relocation, for example. I would also count efforts to pave streets with reflective materials in this category. You know, it's a way of reducing exposure to heat. And I believe we're going to hear more about a pilot project in Los Angeles that's doing exactly that. So I won't talk too much about that. Um, but if you're thinking about how you classify and, and categorize these policies, it would fit here. If we go to the next slide then, uh, that next factor for vulnerability is sensitivity. Uh, so this is an example thinking about dealing with the climate threat of heat, and you can reduce sensitivity through home weatherization programs, ways of increasing the energy efficiency of buildings so that as the temperatures outside go up, 
the temperature inside the house doesn't go up as much, and that reduces um, the sensitivity of, um, for example, low-income home or low-income residents uh, to temperatures going up. Uh, so home weatherization programs, uh, this picture actually comes from the Department of Energy that, of course, funds various programs that are out there. States can implement their own efforts at energy efficiency um, through tax credits or mandates, all sorts of different policies. And maybe as one other example, uh, disaster planning is a way of reducing sensitivity. So, for example, New Mexico has a guide called After Wildfire that is a huge and valuable resource for communities developed by New Mexico State Forestry that is giving tips on how to quickly recover from a wildfire. Uh, so that's a way of reducing the sensitivity of a group to a wildfire by reducing the time it takes for them to get back to normal. The third factor there on the next slide was that adaptive capacity. So policies to do this are, well, really a lot of them just come down to funding. So making sure there's a large enough disaster response fund to deal with a greater increase in number of events, um, making sure there are enough fire trucks available at the beginning of fire season, that kind of thing. But sometimes you can also do it, build adaptive capacity through planning for long-term change. So this example is from Hawaii, which is looking at how to increase capacity to deal with sea level rise. Uh, one of the ways to do that is through beach and dune restoration. So these sorts of nature-based approaches are a way to make the shoreline more flexible and adaptive to sea level rise. Um, Things like vegetation on dunes can uh, slow erosion, they can reduce wave heights during a storm event, and so the, the capacity of the shoreline to deal with climate change actually increases through these policies. So hopefully those examples are helpful. Please do ask questions uh, if anything was unclear. I'll just leave with some specific recommendations. Um, the first is to get a better understanding of the climate risks that you face and there are a wealth of resources to help you with this all across the West. Every state has a state climatologist who is an expert on climate impacts specific to your state and region. These tend to be located at universities. California's uh, state climatologist is actually located uh, in Department of Water Resources. Uh, everyone else is at a university. If you're not in touch with them already, I would recommend that you get in touch so they have a lot of expertise to offer. Um, the federal agencies, NOAA, collects a lot of data, too. Um, local agencies, of course, are dealing with this, uh, although, as we heard at the beginning, they are it's a bit of a mixed bag in terms of how aggressive they are with it. The Western Adaptation Alliance is a collaboration of cities in Arizona, Colorado, New Mexico, Nevada, Utah, and Texas. And so even though they're focused on the local level, they have collected information and resources that could be helpful to you in thinking about partnering with those local governments and, and how to support each other. The next recommendation I would pass on is conducting a climate assessment to examine and communicate climate vulnerabilities for your state and attempt to quantify them and help prioritize them. If your state doesn't have one, now's a good time to do it. And even if your state already has a climate assessment, uh, if it hasn't been updated in a while, it's probably time to update that too. Uh, the scientific understanding of climate risks is changing very rapidly, and it's always helpful to have it in the most up-to-date context. And of course, this doesn't have to be a standalone climate plan. Uh, for example, climate risks can be incorporated into your state's hazard mitigation plan. Uh, so some direction uh, about where to do this examination could be a helpful uh, action to take. Other actions would be the final recommendation, and there are numbers of them. Uh, and I just want to stress that direct regulation is one type of policy and one form of policy to implement, but it is by no means the only one. Financial incentives, market-based policies, uh, these sorts of, of approaches also work very well for reducing exposure and sensitivity and increasing adaptive capacity. And there are numbers of examples there. And uh, one final thing to share with you is that all of these adaptation actions are fiscally responsible. Studies have looked at how much money you save over the long run by investing in adaptation now. 
And uh, the benefits range from something like $4 to up to $15 in benefit for every dollar that's invested. Um, so really, these are smart policies to be examining, to be thinking about. And these actions can also contribute to other priorities that you're thinking about, whether it's stormwater management, um, easing energy burden for low-income households, or ensuring long-term sustainability and other environmental goals. So I'll conclude for now. Uh, thank you again for having me here. Uh, I'm happy to answer questions during the webinar or even offline. My email address is there, and I look forward to the rest of the presentation. Ashley, thank you very much. Um, I think we've. We're going, I think what we'll do is we'll open it up for questions after the uh, second presentation, um, and with that, um, Jonathan Parfrey, you're up. Thanks, Rich. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Jonathan Parfrey. I'm the Executive Director of Climate Resolve. We're based here in Los Angeles, California. In, in 2009, uh, while I was a commissioner at the Los Angeles Department of Water and Power, a local foundation, the Durfee Foundation, uh, awarded me a fellowship to research into what works and what doesn't work on climate change communication and policy. And based on that research, a year later, a group of us uh, founded the group Climate Resolve. And it was a climate group based on unique uh, assumptions in the climate sector. Most of the existing climate change organizations are focused on uh, international treaties, uh, on national uh, US federal policy. Um, and we decided we are going to tack in a very different direction. Although uh, climate change is a global phenomenon, uh, we believe that the best way to ultimately get a lasting um, policies on climate change was instead looking into how we make this issue local, uh, relevant, and uh, what we found is that it has to be solution oriented. Essentially, our work was to put people in the climate picture and then offer solutions that were commensurate uh, with the problem. So we, we may not have been able to uh, all, so far uh, stop uh, greenhouse gas emissions globally, but what we can do is prepare for the inevitable impacts of climate change. Most people don't recognize, and I very much appreciated Ashley's presentation, but there's a 20-year time lag between the source of emission and the actual impact from what comes out of a tailpipe into it being expressed in the weather system. And so we are going to face uh, climate impacts, and California knows this, and we've been helping the state and especially local governments uh, prepare. Here in Los Angeles, uh, organizations focusing on curbing the urban heat island uh, uh, impacts. Um, we currently have one, a cool roof ordinance in the city of Los Angeles. Every new and refurbished uh, rooftop has to be made with uh, materials that reflect solar radiation uh, rather than absorb it. LA County is about to adopt the same uh, measure. And we've also been working on pilots here here in Los Angeles, 15 of them, uh, coincidentally, in all 15 council districts in the city of Los Angeles, uh, where we have put uh, titanium dioxide into some asphalt slurry, the last coat you put on the asphalt, uh, in an attempt to perhaps cool down entire neighborhoods. And thus far, it's been meeting with a, a lot of uh, support from uh, local communities, and it's uh, cooled down neighborhoods by about 15 degrees uh, Fahrenheit. Um, we also fo focus on curbing the source of our biggest source of emissions, which is uh, on the transportation side. Uh, our group formed a coalition that helped win uh, LA County's Measure M last November, which is going to uh, send about $120 billion over the next 40 years uh, into uh, transportation projects. And we like these kind of cl climate solutions where you give people choices, you're reducing traffic, you're providing all these uh, great co-benefits and boosting the local economy at the same time. And we've also focused on winning state laws um, that help both the state agencies and local agencies prepare for climate impacts. And uh, for example, our group uh, is the, the host of the California Climate Change Symposium that puts uh, climate science in, in the hands of uh, state 
uh, uh, um, agencies for them to uh, enact policy. And we've also, at the grassroots level, helped uh, local and state uh, governments uh, implement climate plans and actions. So enough about climate resolve. Next slide, please. I'm here to tell you about um, when regions uh, come together and act collectively on climate policy. And uh, here in the Los Angeles area, there is an organization called the LA Regional Collaborative for Climate Action. So I wanna put you on an airplane. Just imagine you're flying into LAX and you're looking out over that vast sea of asphalt and concrete that is Southern California. And I dare you to pick out the difference between where the city of LA starts and the city of Inglewood uh, stops, where there's unincorporated parts of LA County like Lenox, there's Hawthorne, there's Lawndale, there's Gardena, there's Redondo Beach. You can see all of this out of your window flying into LAX. There's 88 cities in all of Los Angeles. And we recognize that regionally we share the same climate for the most part. We uh, share the same water supply concerns. Uh, we share along the coast the same sea level rise issues. Um, so we believed that we should also look for common solutions that go across uh, multiple jurisdictions. And this is a phenomenon that is taking place in a, in a number of parts of the uh, United States, and especially here in California, I'll be getting to that in a minute, where regional answers can save the, the burden off of each municipality of coming up with its own climate adaptation strategy. Now, I should mention that here in Los Angeles, there is some uh, variability. Uh, in warming, um, there's about 30 degree Fahrenheit difference between what happens on our coasts and what happens in our deserts. Um, like Ashley's slides where she showed all that warming taking place across the Western United States, we've worked with some of the world's greatest uh, climate scientists that have downscaled from 200 kilometer cells down to two kilometer cells. So we're bringing the climate impacts, not just from a global perspective or a mile, you know, 30 mile high perspective, but down to the neighborhood scale. So the predictions are there for Woodland Hills, to Studio City, to, um, to Glendale, to Porter Ranch. When you name neighborhoods and you help the local planners uh, make those adjustments, it does make a huge difference. So we came together uh, as to form LARC in 2008, and our most recent product is a framework for climate action. Um, there are a number of cities, there's uh, councils of governments, there's uh, academia, universities are participating, especially UCLA and business associations. And I should mention it's important that you have some NGOs there as well, because what they provide is um, is the sort of a catalyst for getting people organized. Um, so what you have in front of you right now is a slide of the uh, LARC framework. And I really encourage you to uh, check out that website, climateaction.la. By the way, just an aside, that .la is the URL for the, the country of Laos. And so um, yes, here again, uh, Angelinos are appropriating other people's um, culture, but this time it's just their URL uh, for uh, the country of Laos. So that .la uh, is actually used a lot in Los Angeles. So um, LA believes that it has somewhat of uh, influence and influence beyond our borders. And so we hope that you check out what we have done here in Los Angeles because we think it's influential. And it's broken down into five uh, general sectors of transportation, energy, water, public health, and our uh, oceans and, and coastal uh, communities. And it was spearheaded by UCLA with a very robust process of including many stakeholders. And we also uh, looked at the many planning documents, general plans, state plans, regional plans, and made sure that they this framework applied to all of those plans as well. Next slide, please. And uh, there are also standalone chapters on climate impacts, as well as a chapter on funding and financing. 
uh, the implementation of uh, resilience measures. And uh, again, I very much encourage you to uh, look through this document. Now, the Los Angeles Regional Collaborative is just one of other regional collaboratives throughout the state of California. And around seven years ago, I was talking with uh, Bruce Reardon, who was then the director of the San Francisco Bay Area Collaborative. And we said that we would all benefit from having a conversation, collaboratives uh, talking among themselves. And with the help of a local government commission, we uh, created the Alliance of Regional Collaboratives, which we have named ARCA. And we thought that we would benefit from having a peer group and to learn best practices. And it's transformed, frankly. We have become sort of a perfect uh, focus group for uh, the governor's office of planning and research and for the uh, California Department of Natural Resources to uh, test um, some of their policies and get immediate feedback uh, before those policies are actually released. And in that way, the policies, when they're released, um, are actually well informed and have already uh, been tested. Um, next slide, please. So I want to give you a sense of the location of some of these um, collaboratives. Uh, it started out with Los Angeles and San Diego and the Bay Area. And here's what's really interesting. Um, our organization came together with a number in Los Angeles with a number of key players like the city and the county and some utilities um, and then some smaller cities like Santa Monica uh, um, and Pasadena, others. And then um, we were able to uh, grow it beyond those few numbers, but it was, it was then housed at UCLA. And UCLA was important because it's an academic institution that, you know, there is not this sort of uh, internecine battles between the, 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 the different jurisdictions. And so they were seen as a safe place. And, and the San Diego collaborative as well was fantastic. And so they were seen also as a neutral party. And then in the Bay Area, it was part of a joint policy committee of a, a number of regional agencies, uh, including the uh, Association of Bay Area Governments, APEC. And because of that, uh, having those neutral, disinterested parties, it really was great to bring everyone together. And then um, there's been some transformation uh, over the years. The, the Capital Cities uh, Collaborative came on board in the Sacramento area. Then we added the Sierra Nevada uh, Collaborative, which is very interesting and maybe important for some of the, um, the jurisdictions on this call because it's a very rural area and they need the help of the political base that is located in the urban core in California to be able to enact their plans having to do with climate resilience. And so the rural urban connection is really uh, essential and has become much more elevated. And now we just added the Central Coast Collaborative uh, that stretches from Monterey to Santa Barbara and uh, we believe we'll be adding an Inland Empire collaborative and a North Coast one uh, within the year. And it's very exciting to uh, see these different regions uh, learn from some of the trailblazers and enact some of those policies and gain access to the information so these local jurisdictions can act in an informed way. We've also uh, created a position for the governor's office to have ex officio status. So they're essentially at the table whenever we meet. And there are other affiliates of some companies uh, and some advisors, some academic uh, groups that have also been uh, central players in, in helping this uh, group have a statewide uh, uh, appeal. So um, the next slide is that we, we do provide some uh, real uh, services. Um, the legislative updates uh, are always absolutely critical in tracking uh, climate policy in Sacramento. We, the group ARCA, does not take any positions related to those policies, but um, it can uh, inform those local jurisdictions of what is taking place in Sacramento. Um, we routinely provide educational webinars and um, we are uh, creating a uh, practitioner's uh, directory so that 
all of those uh, groups that are out there, those engineering firms and consulting firms that um, are wanting to get into the resiliency space, uh, we can at least provide a, sort of an annotated, informed uh, sense of their abilities and who they are and what they bring to the table. So with that, um, I just wanted to hit on a point that uh, actually Ashley uh, touched on, and it has to do with the importance of uh, of an economic analysis on uh, meeting the climate challenge. And it's our belief that there is a competitive advantage for those uh, states and jurisdictions that prove themselves resilient to climate change. And it is our hope that California is going to be ready for these climate impacts. Um, we want our ports open and uh, ready for business. Our people are prepared and girded for higher temperatures and our medical facilities are ready to uh, help people get through these hard times. And our water systems will be prepared for both drought and flood. Um, by getting ready for climate change and the challenges that it poses, I think it's a very good thing for the public as well. It gives confidence that you can embrace the future rather than be afraid of it. And we think that that optimism, um, born of preparation, can really be a game changer. And uh, we hope that your states uh, might follow uh, this example. Thank you. Jonathan, thank you very much. Um, <clears throat> While we uh, wait to see if there are any questions that come in, anybody that's listening, please feel free to send your questions in. I have um, I have an, a I have a question for Ashley. Ashley, do you have um, do you have some examples of maybe legislation that's been passed uh, out in the West uh, that deals with uh, climate adaptation? Some examples of states that have done something like this. I. Uh Sure. So in the presentation, I mentioned an example from Hawaii about uh, beach and dune restoration, and that program came under um, a piece of legislation called the Climate Adaptation Initiative Act. So this was passed in two, uh, back in 2014. Um, the legislation established an interagency committee to understand sea level rise vulnerability in particular, uh, develop a statewide adaptation plan, and, uh, and then set aside specific uh, targeted funding. Um, so I think that's a fairly standard example of legislation to date where you're giving the legislative authority to conduct the vulnerability assessment and take some action. You know, more commonly right now, that type of action is taken under executive authority in the states. Um, although there's also examples, and I believe California has legislation for this, I, I know some of the Northeast states do, um, requiring local planning uh, to incorporate climate change risks. So that's the type of legislation that recognizes that these impacts are really felt at the local level more than the state level. Um, so the role of the state seen there was in making sure that local governments were taking action accordingly. Thank you. This is Jonathan. Um, May I answer the same question? Yeah, go ahead. Sure. Well, you know, we, we have the honor of having Senator Wykowski on the call, and, and he is the author of SB 246 that uh, put into code the establishment of a clearinghouse and a technical advisory committee on uh, climate uh, impacts and resilience. And um, in addition to that, there's uh, SB 379 that was a bill by Senator Hannabeth Jackson that um, mandates that all general plans in the state of California are updated uh, with impacts related to uh, climate change and talking in this and in, in identifying in the safety element what that um, county or city is going to do to, to meet that challenge. Uh, SB 1000 is a, a bill that also looks at um, um, environmental justice uh, related to general plans and uh, mandating that they're updated. Very important also in California, uh, we have uh, the cap and trade system, which uh, is, uh, has identified uh, climate uh, adaptation and resilience as uh, one of the outcomes for, the, for that fund. It is 
been passed but with a supermajority. So in California law, it means that funds that are generated on climate change for meeting the climate challenge can be put towards this goal. And uh, there is a limited amount of funding uh, this year, which I trust will increase in future years. So those are just a few examples. Uh, and, you know, if I can build on one other thought, adaptation is rarely a standalone activity. Uh, preparing for these impacts often comes as a co-benefit of work that may be underdone or undertaken anyway. Um, so, for example, if you legislate uh, energy efficiency targets that utilities need to achieve, uh, those are likely going to be met by energy efficiency improvements like like home insulation uh, that's going to reduce sensitivity to climate change impacts in the future. So there's a lot of overlap. Um, so even though adaptation specific legislation is fairly rare, uh, legislative action that can also achieve adaptation benefits I think is more common. Although that overlap I, is hard to tease apart often. Thank you. Uh, I'll let the people that are um, that are listening in, uh, I'll say just one more time, if you've got a question, please uh, send it in now. Uh, I do have one additional question. Uh, Jonathan, do you have any, actually maybe for both of you, but um, any, have you noticed anything that uh, is different in terms of trying to organize uh, groups together from from the aspect of a large metropolitan area versus a rural area? Um, and, and if so, uh, if there are there challenges and any advice? Uh, great question. Um, you know, when, when I think about the, the California situation, you, you have some of the rural communities that have to uh, pitch the, the urban cores to remind them, like Los Angeles, you use our water, uh, you come and recreate in our hills, you ski down our slopes, you need us, uh, you, you use the wood from our forests. And so there, there almost has to be an appeal to urban areas to, to fund uh, these climate resilience uh, activities in rural areas. Um, I would imagine that the dynamic in some of the western states would be the reverse that there would have to be a, a urban rural connection um so that the um so that the urban areas uh might uh, need the rural areas in order to have a majority in the legislature to to see some uh um adaptation activity um but when it comes to things like urban heat island, that isn't so much an issue in rural areas where in urban areas with all the asphalt and all the roofing material and all the parking lots and streets and and uh, playgrounds that simply absorb all of that solar radiation and then re-radiate it out uh, into the surrounding air. Um, that is a big urban problem where uh, rural communities have the advantage of having that natural cooling that already exists. Yeah, we've had some experience trying to reach out to um, to farms and, and also local communities um, in agricultural districts and understanding how to best raise awareness of climate change impacts uh, and take action. And one of the keys to success that we found is to use trusted messengers in the community. Um, you know, people who um, the local governments in rural areas or the smaller businesses in those areas are already used to talking to. So um, the extension service that may be in touch with individual farmers or the emergency planner for the county, um, right down to local firefighters, the people who are trusted in the community and understand weather as as it impacts um, residents and businesses too, getting those people to be more aware of how conditions are changing around them and how their practices will need to be modified to accommodate those changes is an effective way to reach out. So I, I think that would be my rural communities is uh, again, don't recreate the wheel and try to create something new. Find the way that the practices you're already doing 
can incorporate an adaptation or a climate resilience lens to them. And I guess, uh, I guess when I think about it, um, probably if you, if I think one of you, maybe Ashley, was you mentioned, uh, ev you know, everybody should do a, a, like a climate audit, or I mean, like where I are know. we? And that 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 might probably then generate kind of the strategy on how how you would go about um, also organizing people and so forth. Um, I'm looking. This is, this is, uh, Senator Whitehouse. I guess I'd like Jonathan and Ashley to talk. It seems like we're we're getting very close to this technical advisors because you know many of these local firefighters or key people in a particularly in a rural area have you know they they well read and uh, good intentions but it's the it's how do they finish the job on this these advising their local electeds or the state folks on what technical steps need to be taken um uh to get to the promised land can they comment on that a little bit uh thank you senator um you know, there is a very interesting movement afoot among uh, others um, that are seeing the scale of uh, forest fires. And they, um, it was, I think one of the more of, of uh, organizing would be to help these groups um, reach their representatives in both the, the state and federal government. What is their uh, firsthand um, observation? Uh, related to that, and Ashley referenced this, are the FEMA hazard mitigation you know, planning process. And I think that that is something that um, everyone who is in state government could focus on and uh, include uh, some of the effects from uh, the additional warming or from additional, you know, wildfires and uh, and there should be some funds from the federal government uh, should be available to us uh, through through FEMA. Yeah, and to get at the notion of how do you take the on the ground awareness and of legislators who want to take effective action on this issue, I think the model of the climate collaboratives that are being done across California that Jonathan talked about are a great example. Um, it, it's such a nice way to convene businesses, uh, government, NGO, other interested experts, uh, really understand the issues and be a trusted source for what solutions work for each individual community. Um, we have one question that came and it's this. It seems like some aspects of adaptation are going to be more effectively solved at a local level. And so what are your thoughts on what aspects need to be at the state versus the local level? Do you have thoughts on how to integrate the difference? Yeah, I think the answer is partnership and collaboration. Um, most of the impacts are going to be fairly localized, at least if we think about extreme weather events, the kind of acute shocks uh, like a fire, like a flood uh, that people think about. I suppose something like drought or fire tend to have a larger footprint, and so there's a wider reach there. But uh, I had an earlier slide showing economic impacts across the country, uh, and some of the projections are that Florida and Texas could lose something like 20% of their GDP by the end if they don't take action. Well, what happens when all of those people from Texas and Florida who can't find work are moving to western states where it is friendlier to them? communities? So, does the state anticipate large demographic together with local government fund public services to, uh, the types of activities that would need to be done for that sort of a slow big shift uh, I think that can only be done by working together yeah to answer to try to answer that wonderful question it, it's actually really important 
Um, you know, cities are where the impacts are felt. It's where the, the public safety officers are, the first response are, are located. It's at the local level. It's where the public health is also. But, you know, it's also at the public, local level. And that is something really guarded. Uh, um, to climate impacts, um, local influence that local jurisdiction choices when it comes to the changes that are needed uh, related to uh, dealing with climate impacts. And they may need the excuse of a state authority or a JPA that is empowered regionally to make some of those land use choices. When it comes to uh, San Francisco Bay, for example, and their sea level rise, um, and, and Google municipality um, have the ability to tell Google, don't put your new headquarters right next to the will yield all of this revenue for my city, move it somewhere else or move it further back. It, it becomes um, the, the local jurisdictions will need the help of either a regional approach or a statewide approach uh, that can compel some action. And I think that's the, the help that has been garnered through SB 246, Senator Wyckowski's bill, that empowers the state to be looking for ways it can help local governments. But ultimately, years from now, and I don't think this is going to happen in California anytime soon, we're going to have to have a very hard conversation about land use authority and what that looks like in the face of uh, climate impacts. And I'm not suggesting we have the answer, but I'm just suggesting that it's going to be a, a very hard but important conversation to have. Thank you both for that answer. Um, I think we're just about at the top of the hour. Um, so without any other questions that I've seen, I would like to uh, thank Shante Hopkins, who does all the magic to make this all happen back at the Council of State Government's uh, National Office in Kentucky. I'd like to thank both presenters. And uh, with that, I will turn it back over to the Senator for some concluding remarks. Well, Rich, I wanna thank uh everybody who tuned in uh, to participate with this webinar, and especially our two presenters, Jonathan Parfrey of Climate Resolve and Ashley Lawson of the Center for Climate and Energy uh, Solution, um, as well as you, Rich, uh, CGS West uh, Consultant for Energy and Environment, you're in charge of this committee. I just, I just I'm the figurehead. Um, it has been a fascinating discussion um, put on today, and I hope everyone found it as thought-provoking as I did. My notes are all over the top of my desk. Um, I, you know, I'm proud of the steps that California's taken, and I'm encouraged what we've heard today because there are next steps, this continued collaboration uh, that needs to um, occur. There's a lot of work that we still need to do, and a lot of pressing uh, work uh, to make sure that each state in the West and each state in the Union are ready to adapt to the climate uh, uh, that's changing and making, whether it's farmland or our urban areas or our working lands, and just more resilient. So thank you everyone and look forward to seeing people in uh, Utah. Thank you.